had uh, John presented for 45 minutes this morning at McMaster, a beautiful lecture with lots of slides. Uh, they're up, up to date, right, two weeks ago. Uh, so this is a very, very current presentation. And uh, I have to say, I have read the book, uh, except for the last few pages, I haven't made it right to the end. But, uh, and I thought I knew a lot about uh, oil and war, but um, I learned a lot in this book. John connects the dots between pipelines, strategic choke, choke points of transportation, oil reserves, and all the other, uh, all the other uh, aspects of the petroleum industry, and he makes it very clear the role that the petroleum industry has played in all the wars of this century, Afghanistan, Syria, Iraq, Libya, and so on. Ukraine even. So this is a very current presentation. Um, now, let me say that, uh, that um, my name is Ken Stone, and uh, I'm the treasurer of the coalition, the Hamilton Coalition to Stop the War. And our coalition was founded 17 years ago, this November 16th. And so we've been in business, in operation force, almost 17 years now. And we haven't had to change the name, uh, Hamilton Coalition to Stop the War, because for those entire 17 years, there's been a war. We've been living in a state of permanent war since 9-11. And by all indications, it doesn't seem as if there'll be any change in that situation very soon. Um, so, I wanted you to know as well, for people who are new to, the, uh, to us and to, this, uh, uh, to our coalition, that we have a website. It's very simple, the initials of our coalition, hcsw.ca. Uh, we have a Facebook page, we have a Twitter account. Um, we have uh, also a, a radio show, our own radio show called Unusual Sources. And it's brought, been broadcasting for years and years. The hosts are Doug Brown and Brendan Stone. It's Wednesdays at 5, uh, CFMU, McMaster. Um, CFMU.ca, um, 93.3 on your FM dial. And uh, uh, Doug interviewed uh, John Foster recently. Um, so we have a lot of things on our plate. Right now, uh, when you sat down, you probably had a pink uh, flyer on your seat. And that announces uh, the next of our lectures. Uh, that will be Stephen Gallons on his new book, Israel, a Beachhead in the Middle East. And following that, in November 11th, on Remembrance Day, we have one of the most famous Americans uh, here, will be here. His name is Ajamu Baraka. He ran as the vice presidential candidate of the Green Party in the USA in the last uh, US election. And on December the 3rd, we will have Vanessa Bealey, the world famous journalist who has been deflating the balloon of the white helmets in Syria. So we have a, a pretty good program for the fall. And we hope that you will continue to come out. And if you are interested in becoming more involved in our coalition, uh, we always are looking for new people to join the executive and help us carry the load. So um, please see me afterwards if you'd like to become a member of our executive. Um, Jerry uh, Benello has a, has a clipboard with an email list. There he is. Got everybody. We've got everybody so far? Great. Thanks, Jerry. And uh, I think at this point, I will uh, ask Henry to come forward and do the land acknowledgement. Ani Ojo Wasa Kibenjaba Kineshki Babiko Kerea Kosemotek Widibimshina Widok Mishnan Besko Nzidon Nana Esbesko Kdeyan Wenbek Gabsish Nami Kabesko Riminmi Kabesko Nindami I always open now with the Anishinaabe language. I think it's important that uh, not only that we do the acknowledgement but that we honor the, the language that was originally spoken on these lands. We'd like to begin this uh, by acknowledging the land on which we gather is the traditional territory of the Mississauga Anishinaabe, the Wyandotte, and the Haudenosaunee. The territory is covered by the Upper Canada Treaties, and it's within the lands protected by the Dish with One Spoon Treaty. 
uh, and wampum. This agreement, uh, and it's directly adjacent to the Haldeman Treaty. The dish, or sometimes called the bowl, represents what is now southern Ontario from the Great Lakes to Quebec and from Simcoe to the United States. We all eat out of the dish. All of us that share this territory with only one spoon. That means we have to share responsibility of ensuring the dish is never empty. We only take what we need. We have a responsibility not only to the land and the creatures that share, we share it with, but also to our future generations, to our children, our grandchildren, and their children and grandchildren. So it's, it's vitally important that we honor and remember. And you'll notice that there are no knives at the table representing that we must keep the peace. Thank you. Thank you, Henry. Uh, and now to introduce uh, the speaker, John Foster, I'm very pleased to call upon Professor Atif Kabursi. Thank you, Ken. Uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to introduce John Foster. He comes to us uh, very well prepared. He's an internationally renowned oil economist uh, with experience over 40 years. He has lectured uh, in many places. His articles appear in the Globe and Mail, and the, his book is now one of the best uh, on the oil industry. And I know this from a fact. Uh, the story is, uh, let's all ask ourselves, would there have been a war in the Gulf if Iraq grew potatoes? <laughs> that, that's why I'm going to retire in PEI as a safe place. Uh, the, the, the story is very crucial in, in terms of uh, the dynamics of this commodity that is, as John would tell us, uh, the largest component of international trade. And it's not a commodity in many respects. I mean, nobody produces oil in many areas. It comes to the surface totally without the intervention of a single person. I've seen it going from the oil well into a tanker without the intervention of a person. It's an unrenewable resource in the sense the more we use of it, the less is available. It takes thousands of years for it to accumulate. And today is becoming a real menace in the sense that the carbon budget uh, that would thwart or, pre or prevent climate change would require that all the fossil fuel would remain in the ground. Uh, I come from a region that we have paid very heavily for oil being there. Uh, in many respects, I am really unconvinced whether it was a blessing. If anything, it may have been a curse. It has completely thwarted democracy because it perverts the relationship between the ruler and the ruled. The rulers now get their money without people paying it. Actually, the people depend on the prince or the king opening the purse. It has really been coveted by everybody, and John knows more than anybody else. Uh, Trump, Trump who, go, who cares? Uh, Bush, but they're all the same. And he has always called or referred to Arab oil as our oil. All right, and now they think also that Venezuela's oil is also their oil. Five trillion had come to the region. What do we have seen? What have we seen from it? All right, huge towers, yeah, maybe a bit of an infrastructure, but no diversification. The people are still poor. The oil countries in the Middle East have a record of the worst income inequality in the world. Unemployment in Saudi Arabia is over 15%, one of the largest, one of the highest in the world. Well, I'm not going to give the lecture. Uh, <laughs> the scholar that we have here is very well prepared and has visited so many countries, lectured so many places. He comes uh, with incredible uh, capacity and knowledge uh, to inform us all. I look forward. I've read your book and I think I'm going to buy more too. It's a fantastic book. Please, you know, do yourself a favor by reading this book. Without further ado, Mr. John Foster, it's a pleasure.
make sure you can hear me all right. Well, so uh, the, first, well, the first thing I'd like to say is uh, I don't recognize myself in any of this at all. And the second, I, I really would enjoy, I was enjoying sitting back there. I thought maybe I could perfectly well take my place and give, give you something uh, really terrific. And I, I, I thank everybody here uh, for, for being here tonight. And I, I thank the organizers and uh, uh, Ken and Jerry there for uh, for having the, what can I say, the, the boldness to invite me. <laughs> so, number one, I, th I think with this amplification, people in the back can hear me, but if you cannot, please put your hand up, because I would be devastated if I heard at the end, pretty pictures on the screen and I couldn't hear a word. Uh, and the other thing being, if you can't understand my version of English, then come back to me afterwards and I'll help you with what I said, I think. So anyhow, I'm, I'm, I'm delighted, so two talks in one day. It was very interesting this morning, uh, we're seeing students there who uh, probably have never been born in this century, have never known it not to be war, certainly in, in the case of Afghanistan. Um, Jerry asked me for a photograph, uh, which you probably have seen. Uh, that's me, a kind of pictorial version of, on the road. And I, I spent my working life as a petroleum economist with a briefcase and a suitcase uh, visiting one country after another. Seldom speaking publicly, certainly not like this. Uh, I wasn't allowed to. It would have been a, a very quick way uh, to lose my job, to be shown the door. Uh, but now I'm retired. Uh, I must confess I didn't enjoy the, the idea of being retired initially. But it has a great advantage that uh, I'm now... Uh, free to research and free to speak independently. And uh, by the way, uh, uh, everything I'm going to say tonight uh, is uh, from public source. I have no inside sources anywhere. So uh, why am I interested in this topic? Uh, where, where am I coming from? Uh, it began a dozen years ago, basically, to, with, with Afghanistan, when troops first went to Kandahar. Uh, why was Afghanistan so important? And then I watched one intervention after another, just as Ken was saying, as there was uh, Iraq and Libya and Syria and Ukraine, uh, and now we have Iran and Venezuela. They're, they're not uh, fighting wars, but they're certainly economic interventions uh, which are war of another kind. And I found all these particular interventions, which I'm going to talk about tonight, uh, have a petroleum story. And uh, that, that's uh, part of the motivation for writing this book. People started to put me in a half Nelson and tell me I, I, I had to do it. Uh, and so these three P's of petroleum and power and politics, uh, and pipelines, I guess it's number four, they, they all go together. And looking closely at each conflict, um, I found a pattern, you, know, sort of make, you can make a, a matrix, I had one in chapter 10 of this book, where you have, it doesn't all happen, but you can do a checklist and see country by country how it works out. Um, a leader previously tolerated or indeed courted uh, is demonized. Uh, and then you can put your names in. And then sanctions are imposed. And then covert forces uh, move in to assist the rebels or jihadis from day one, some of the, in some cases even before. Uh, and then horror stories uh, start, you know, like uh, Saddam Hussein and, and babies in the incubator. And war begins, and the leader is, the leader is ousted, you can think of Saddam Hussein and, and uh, Gaddafi, and the regime is changed and chaos endures. And some countries clearly were not, we haven't got to that point quite yet, like Venezuela or Iran. Now, uh, I make a, a disclaimer at this point uh, on, the th on the theme I'm going to pursue. Uh, that is about fossil fuels and global warming, of course, it's a great preoccupation. And in Canada, the biggest uh, source of, of uh, emissions is petroleum production, especially from the Alberta oil sands. Uh, petroleum production is responsible for one quarter, 26% 20, I think I saw, of, of all Canadian greenhouse gases, which is just a, a tad more than the, the uh, similar uh, emissions from uh, uh, transportation, the use of petroleum in transportation. 
what tonight I want to talk about the connection between uh, petroleum power and politics. Uh, looking at the world as a whole because it's integrated all those conflicts in the Middle East uh, and elsewhere and how they touch Canada. And of course there are other issues involved in these particular disputes but petroleum is seldom talked about. Now researching uh, the geopolitics was a bit like solving a, a jigsaw puzzle uh, or a crossword puzzle, I actually rather like that. Uh, putting together bits and pieces uh, from official documents, uh, speeches, statistics, events, uh, even as the picture kept changing day by day. You know, we got to thought they got a decent understanding of what's going on. Then President Trump gets elected. <laughs> so back to the drawing board. <laughs> Oil is the most important commodity in world trade. It's the lifeblood of modern economies, and it's a source of great wealth. And it flows worldwide by pipeline and by ship, and so does natural gas. And by the way, when I say petroleum, I mean both oil and natural gas. They're all hydrocarbons, and natural gas, I think, in the geopolitics of it all, uh, rather gets overlooked. The Middle East accounts for half the world's proven oil reserves and about 40% of its gas. It's the world's energy heartland. This slide, uh, which looks a bit like a Christmas pudding with raisins in it, is, is the so-called oil corridor. And all those giants, uh, all those black spots are giant oil and gas reservoirs. And the corridor runs south-north uh, south from Saudi Arabia, the Gulf states, uh, through Iraq and Iran to the Caspian Sea. And petroleum has been a major reason for, for Western involvement in the Middle East. That has been with the British and then after that with the Americans. So uh, I guess people here tonight mostly will remember Vice President Dick Cheney. Uh, and 20 years ago he said, which is picking up on it uh, as he uh, thought, uh, the degree of inv government involvement makes oil a unique commodity. The Middle East, he said, is still where the prize ultimately lies. So it's unique with government involvement. So oil is so much in our news. It didn't used to be. I mean, if I said oil 20 years ago, people would look at me and say, boring. Uh, <laughs> but now it's a bit different. And the latest we see, of course, is this drone attack uh, on Abqaiq and it's the, those facilities in Saudi Arabia and the oil field too. Uh, knocking out half the uh, half Saudi oil production, and that's more than Canada's total oil production. Uh, it's five percent of the world's production, and the Saudis have spent billions of dollars on uh, weaponry, and they have the Patriot missile defence system and U.S. advisors, but they couldn't protect their vital oil facilities, and it was a shock. So. Who did it and why? Uh, well, the Houthi in Yemen uh, claimed responsibility right away. And they want to force the Saudis to stop bombing uh, Iran, a, a dreadful business, and the British, French, and uh, Americans uh, to stop helping. Yemen. And that's Yemen. And the uh, Saudis and the Americans blame, of course, the Iranians, uh, uh, which you won't be surprised. And Iran denies it. But of course, it does want to force Washington back into the nuclear deal uh, to end US unilateral sanctions. Uh, uh, and Iran warns, if it can't export its oil, then the Saudis and the others in the Gulf uh, have better watch out. Why should they export theirs either? The rivalry for control of the world's oil and gas resources is what I call the petroleum game. But it's a real game. Uh, and in this game, Governments jockey for geopolitical advantage over others. And it's played by global countries, China, Russia, but especially the United States. And it's played by regional countries too, you can think of Iran and Saudi Arabia. And the reality is that uh, oil and geopolitics are inseparable, yet it's an insufferable, and rarely discussed openly. So, 
and want to uh, introduce the three global countries, first of all, China, Russia, and the United States. China, these are little thumbnail sketches. Uh, China is the world's largest oil importer, and it's concerned about potential blockades of sea routes like the Persian Gulf, uh, the Strait of Malacca, and the South China Sea, through which the oil comes into China. And to reduce its vulnerability, China has invested in huge uh, oil and gas pipelines from Central Asia, about th you know, three or four thousand kilometers long, before they even reach the western border of China, um, from Siberia and across Myanmar, where the Rohingya problem is. Russia has become China's largest single source of oil and gas. And even so, China is heavily reliant on Middle East oil. China is planning massive investments to uh, link it with Europe by land and sea. And that's its Belt and Road Initiative, the BRI, uh, many billions of, I guess, run of financial support. And the US is resisting the BRI. And China has created a new bank, the Asian Investment uh, Inv Infrastructure Investment Bank, a kind of alternative to the World Bank, uh, with 69 member countries, when I last counted, including Canada, and not the United States. And I think under Andrew Scheer, not, it wouldn't be Canada again either. Russia is a petro-state, and is the world's single largest exporter of oil and gas. Some might think it's Saudi Arabia, but those are the numbers I have. Pipelines and sea routes uh, to market are vital to its economy. And it wants to sell its number one resource, petroleum, uh, in Asia in particular, and Europe. And Russia is building pipelines to China, as I said, and uh, is trying to build more to Europe, about which I'll talk. Recognize that guy. The United States has an enormous abundance of oil, gas, and coal. And President Trump asserted in 2017, can't imitate him, but I'll give you his words, with these incredible resources, my administration will seek not only American energy independence, but American energy dominance. And I'll go on to illustrate that during the course of this talk. The U.S. Interior Secretary said about this time last year that the U.S. Navy can blockade Russia, Russia if needed, to make sure that their energy doesn't go to market. Kind of a friendly thing to say. And the United States regard, re, regards petroleum as a vital interest. Now, these two words are key to know that they really mean business. And it uses more oil than any other country, and many of its rivalries and conflicts uh, have a petroleum connection. Washington has literally, you do it by people and by numbers, Washington has literally hundreds of people monitoring world energy at the departments of uh, state, energy, commerce, the National Energy Security, the Pentagon, and the CIA. And no other government can match this scale of coverage. I think they have, they have over 100 people doing this in State Department alone. Some of these characters used to come by my office when I was working in Washington at the World Bank there. Uh, and I, I never quite understood why, but they, uh, there are a lot of them. So, I'm going to talk about Canada, but I, that's not the major theme tonight. I want to just put Canada into, into this international context. Canada, as uh, Stephen Harper said, has become an energy superpower. And in oil production, Canada now ranks uh, with, in fact, I think a bit more, uh, uh, with Iran and Iraq and China, the, the big three being the United States, uh, Russia and Saudi Arabia. So Canada's already number four. Canada's huge oil reserves are being developed rapidly, mostly from the Alberta oil sands. Saskatchewan, Newfoundland, and uh, BC also are oil provinces, but Alberta accounts for about 80% of Canada's oil production. And the intent is to keep expanding. So how much do you want to expand by? So how to bring uh, Alberta's ever-expanding oil production to market? The oil industry, as you know, 
uh, says that pipeline constraints are blocking exports depressing prices. And pipelines have become a major political issue. There are now newspapers yes, you know, in the last two or three days. Canada's oil exports go almost 100% to the United States. It wants to diversify, uh, to, to, uh, to uh, nurture uh, exports of oil to Europe and to Asia. To build new pipelines to the west coast and maybe the east as well. Trans Mountain, perhaps Energy East revived. Uh, my question is a bit different from the environmental one, which is very, very real. Uh, but the, my question is, who wants to buy the oil? It's bitumen. So I'd like to talk about bitumen for a second. The thing is about oils. There are all sorts of different kinds of oils. There are different kinds, and they, when you refine them, they have different mixtures in them. Some have more gasoline, and some have more of this, more fuel oil, more ga kerosene. But bitumen is very different from conventional uh, like crude oil, it's that dreadful three-letter word, it's tar. Uh, it's high in sulfur, it's high in metallic contaminants. And it must be diluted with condensate, that means gasoline, uh, before it can be shipped by pipeline. Otherwise it just won't flow down the line at all. And it's very costly to extract, upgrade and refine. And it's worth, as a result, much less than good quality crude oils. It needs high oil prices worldwide to be profitable. So I, I mentioned extracting and upgrading and refining, and I want to just say a bit about the, the upgrading aspect, uh, which you don't have to do in the case of, of, of regular uh, lighter crude oils. It involves busting the bitumen molecules, these big long chains of molecules, into smaller molecules and then removing the sulfur and the other impurities. And you then have a synthetic crude oil, which you can market, you can send it to, sell it to refineries, you can refine it into products like gasoline. Now, upgraders cost multi-billion dollars uh, to install, that's billions of dollars each. And uh, so a refiner will not build one unless they have to. The export market, uh, let me say that in Alberta, I think perhaps, half, roughly speaking, half the oil is, is upgraded and the other half not. And, and it's, it's the upgraded that, that goes down the pipelines of synthetic crude oil to our eastern refineries, as far east uh, as Quebec City. Um, the export market for oil sands bitumen is the United States, because it's in the United States that they do have specialized refineries uh, that can upgrade and refine it. And they exist in Alberta as well, but they do not exist worldwide, and not, not else uh, in Canada other than Alberta either. Um, they're highly expensive. Now, on buying Trans Mountain last year, which you and I own, Justin Trudeau de uh, declared his expansion a vital interest uh, to Canada. And he said, it will be built. Andrew Scheer wants to revive Energy East again for bitumen, a huge pipeline, 1.1, 1.2 million barrels a day, mostly for export to Europe. Well, to me, all this, where do I come out on it? Uh, it it's maximum of faith economics. Uh, if you build it, buyers will come. Well, environmental issues apart, and that, that's, that's, a big, that's a bigger part, uh, my question is, why would overseas refiners buy oil sands bitumen? What assurance do we have that they're going to do it? The contracts don't exist. Uh, not yet. But the line, uh, so they have choices as refiners, and that's why they have supply departments. I, I've worked in one. And the world is awash in high quality crude oils. But luckily for Canada, the United States is the world's largest consumer of oil. Uh, Washington is concerned about dependence on, on foreign oil imports, but it doesn't regard Canadian oil as foreign. <laughs> With fracking, which is the extracting uh, of oil and gas from shale basins, uh, Production has increased dramatically in the United States in the last decade, uh, and almost from nothing. And the United States now has become the world's largest oil 
produce of it. And in a dozen years, US imports of oil have fallen dramatically. Uh, mind you, in, in gross, you know, you get, you get exports of oil from the United States too now, but, uh, which you hadn't in the past, but, but uh, uh, this is they import and export. But uh, uh, regarding their imports, the world is still the, lar the world's largest single uh, oil importer, only surpassed by China. And so, questions. Where does the oil come from? Well, half of it comes from Canada. And the rest, Saudi Arabia, Mexico, Africa, which means Nigeria, basically, and until this year, Venezuela. World oil prices uh, collapsed five years ago because new oil from the United States and Canada swamped the market like a tsunami. Middle Eastern countries refused to cut output. The tsunami was too huge. Uh, you, used to, you know, Saudi Arabia was always called the swing country of world production, depending upon the variance in, in demand. But they, uh, the, the, the amount of new oil coming in from, from North America uh, was equivalent to about half of what Saudi Arabia produces. So Saudi, the Saudis are not about to cut what they produce by half. Mind you, they had to two weeks ago, but that was enforced upon them. Same amount. <laughs> oil prices have since recovered part way, but the earlier heady expectations have not returned. For Canada, lower prices meant that international companies such as Shell, uh, ConocoPhillips, the, the Norwegian Stat Oil, uh, pulling out of the oil sands. Bitumen, as I said, is expensive to uh, extract, upgrade, and refine. And they're ex in, uh, investing in uh, lower cost oil elsewhere. Some, some are doing it in the, uh, the fracking oil in the United States. Uh, others, BP is an example of that, are investing big time in Russia, which has some of the cheapest, uh, forgive me, lowest cost oil in the world. It's the Canadian-based companies that remain entrenched. Same thing happened, I might say, in the 1970s under the National, under the National Energy Programme. They're the ones that got caught when the oil prices collapsed. So the, they need higher oil prices to be profitable. And they've been, of course, lobbying for uh, no carbon taxes and for, for, for tax relief, relief. Now, with this dramatic fall in US oil imports, whose oil took the hit. Well, above all, as I hinted, it's uh, Venezuela. And round two has been in Washington's crosshairs for decades, uh, 40, over four decades since 1979. And so earlier uh, uh, were Iraq and Libya. And look what happened to them. And oil is being used as, a, as an economic weapon. Now, I'm, I'm going now to talk about each of these countries, rather, you know, there's snapshots, so, so if you want more, there's, <laughs> and you're suckers for it, there's the book. <laughs> um, so, um, off we go around the world, fasten your seatbelts. Talking about Iraq, in the 2016 presidential debate, Donald Trump actually said, in a different way of speaking, it used to be the victor. Uh, belongs the spoils. There was no victory, but I always said, take the oil. So, frank, isn't it? Um, so Trump's frank comment contrasts with what George W. Bush said in 2003. Now, he claimed the war was not about oil. Of course, wars for resources are illegal under the UN Charter. And uh, he talked instead about bringing democracy, you know, human rights to, to the Middle East. That's what governments do. Uh, but what actually happened? Well, Dick Cheney, who, whom you remember, uh, became vice president in 2001, and the first task he was given by, within two weeks by George Bush uh, was to lead an energy task force. And it focused on Iraq. That, that's a report that came out, of, and that's a map that came out of his report, and required a freedom of information a lawsuit to, to get it out and onto the screen here, not by me though. Um, so the, the task force was focusing on Iraq, and Washington indeed prepared an oil draft oil policy for Iraq, which is very thoughtful of them, uh, before the invasion. 
and it was designed to open Iraq's oil uh, to Western companies, particularly American ones. And in 2005, and that's two years after the invasion, Washington shared a draft oil law, it's written by KPMG, uh, with oil companies, Shell Oil, uh, with IMF, with the World Bank, and only then with, with the Iraqi government. Uh, but guess what? Uh, the uh, Iraqi parliament refused to enact it. Now, during the invasion, the oil ministry and the oil fields were protected. Other ministries and museums were looted, protected too late. And Washington insiders like General Abizade, and I think he's now the US ambassador in Saudi Arabia, but he then he led, he led CENTCOM, Central Command, and Alan Greenspan, who'd run the Central Bank, now admit there was an oil agenda. Well, Iraq is an oil giant. Uh, it has the world's fifth largest uh, reserves. At that time, it, it was thought to be number three. Uh, and it was a prosperous country through the 1970s, uh, into the 1980s, then, then, then of course the embargo started. And now, it's a mess. We'll move to, to Libya. So Libya, too, illustrates a country, uh, an attack on a country with oil resources. And Libyan oil is top quality, uh, low in sulfur content. It commands top dollar. It's got lots of gasoline in it. And whatever his faults, Gaddafi used the oil wealth to Libyan advantage. He made education and uh, health care both free. Uh, and Libya had a 90% literacy rate, the lowest infant mortality in Africa, and the highest life expectancy. It was a glowing case uh, before 2011. Now, the NATO war was sold as the responsibility to protect R2P. Um, and uh, I, I was reflecting that two weeks ago in Kingston, I heard uh, Romeo Dallaire talking uh, to us about, uh, about R2P and, and, uh, and Rwanda. Uh, the talk was about PT PTSD, all these initials. Uh, but in fact, in the case of Libya, it was hijacked. Uh, it, it was regime change with 9,700 strike sorties over eight months. It's quite a lot. Think of that over Hamilton, uh, led by a Canadian general, uh, General Bouchard. And eight years later, Libyans flee as refugees to Europe, uh, many drowning en route. So, we, uh, Libya remains fragmented, bankrupt, chaotic, and in conflict, and oil exports too uh, remain sporadic. You can't rely on them. Libya is a failed state. Well, after those two jolly tales, uh, it's, the, it's the turn of Iran. The West talks about Iran's human rights but really about its immense oil and gas resources under state control, that's the Iranian National Oil Company. And it's always interesting to look at history from the other person's point of view. What's it like to be in the other person's shoes? Uh, and what Americans remember is 1979, when the Shah was toppled and US diplomats were taken hostage. It's, in, it's kind of in the blood, they've never forgiven. Uh, uh, Iran for that. And what Iranians remember is foreign interference in the 1950s. Uh, they had a democratic government through to, certainly through to 1952, uh, which nationalized the oil industry. And there's a lot of back history leading up to that, and bad blood. And foreign oil companies then blackballed Iran and no oil flowed for 18 months. So what Iran is going through today with the sanctions is nothing new for Iran. It's like uh, a reprise. Um, and then the United States and uh, Britain organized a coup, that's the MI6 and CIA, installed the Shah, a brutal regime, and they installed their companies to manage the oil. And I, I guess I'm a beneficiary of that. Uh, since uh, at the Anglo-Iranian Oil Company, nat nationalized in Iran, uh, morphed into BP, and uh, which went in for culture, culture change and re-recruiting. Re there I was. So, Iran is a regional power, uh, a challenge to US control of the Middle East. Washington has abandoned the nuclear deal, reimposed oil sanctions. 
It wants to shut down Iran's oil exports 100% and it wants regime change. But, and this is my point, I mean, you know that, but the point is that, that sanctions are unilateral. Uh, they are not endorsed by the United Nations, and the sanctions even apply to foreign companies, I mean, not only European ones, but also to Canadian, um, trading or investing in Iran's production. And where would I those companies if they do? Now, China is powerful enough. It continues to import Iranian oil. It's told the Washington to get lost. Uh, very politely. But India gave way. Uh, and the Europeans evidently too, though they, they have a mechanism, some countries have a mechanism for, for, for what I call minor imports into, uh, in, into, into Iran. Uh, and the, their banks uh, and their companies uh, aren't willing to risk enormous US fines. There's an Italian bank that fined $1.3 billion the other day. You recognize the lady. Relations between Canada and China took a deep chill with the arrest of Huawei's uh, chief financial officer, uh, Ming Wan Su. And uh, that, of course, is Canada, uh, the world's largest telecoms manufacturer. You think of SNC Levana, where, the, government, the, where the, the, the government's going after the firm and not after the individuals. So here we have a case where the individual has been, been put into. Uh, in my view, a hostage situation. And the US wants her extradited. And it says tra uh, Huawei uh, traded with Iran prior to the nuclear deal, uh, breaking US sanctions. Um, there's a lot of history behind that, but to my mind, the point is that these sanctions are purely American. And the Chinese are angry, and they would threaten consequences, and they stopped importing Canadian canola and meat. So I say, yeah, it's a dangerous thing to do, uh, and we want them to import oil sands bitumen. Uh, the world is awash in higher quality oil. How to make friends. So sanctions are part of efforts uh, to gain mastery of the Middle East. Uh, the United States is lined up with Saudi Arabia, UAE, and Israel. And they've been supporting rebels or jihadi in Syria. NATO is ensconced in uh, Iraq, particularly in the northeast, the Kurdish area, and the U.S. and Britain support the Saudi war, war in, uh, in Yemen, so do the French. And they paint Iran uh, as an enemy, kind of a useful enemy, uh, but Iran has support from Russia, Turkey, and China. The Persian Gulf uh, links to the Indian Ocean through the Strait of Hormuz, and through it goes 30% of the world's seaborne oil every day from the Gulf states, from Iraq, from Iran, and its closure would be an economic catastrophe. In June, six tankers were mysteriously attacked near the Straits of Hormuz, and the US blamed Iran, and Iran blamed the US and its proxies. In July, uh, uh, Britain seized a tanker offshore uh, Gibraltar, carrying Iranian oil and allegedly to Syria. As it turned out, it did go to Syria. And John Bolton, who then was the secu national security advisor, tweeted his delight. It was clear that uh, Washington had been tracking this, this tank all the way from the Persian Gulf and through up past the Cape of Good Hope and up, and had man clearly manufactured the incident. And tit for tat, Iran seized the British tanker in the Strait of Hormuz both fortunately now released. So, yeah, so Gibraltar released the tanker. Uh, and Gibraltar is a British colony and is part of the European Union. And the European Union has no sanctions on Iran. Uh, it has sanctions on its own trade, its own investment uh, with Syria. And e EU sanctions uh, differ from US sanctions. They do not apply to other countries like, say, Iran, trading with Syria. Uh, and it's a vital difference. Uh, what about Canada? Uh, is, is Canada getting drawn into this? Well, its sanction policy uh, corresponds to the European. Uh, it has sanctions on Syria, but not on Iran. Um, let me move on from that little happy thought to Venezuela, sort of 
get a bit of jet lag and off we go. The world of petroleum uh, is interconnected. The other head offices are of these companies in London and Houston, Paris, and the, uh, and the, the, and the, the, the governments too. But, and they're, they're monitoring Venezuela in the same breath as, as Iran. And Venezuela has the largest proven oil reserves in the world. John Bolton was explicit about US intent. And he said, it will make a great difference to the United States economically if we could have American oil companies invest and produce the oil capabilities in Venezuela. 20 years ago, Hugo Chavez was elected president of Venezuela, and he had immense charisma. Uh, he championed the poor, those living in the barrios, tumbling down the city hillsides, it's all the first sight you'd see coming out of the airport at Macatea. And he was heartily disliked by the Venezuelan elite, and of course by the uh, uh, Venezuelan press. Chavez uh, tapped Venezuela's oil wealth to improve living standards, health and education. It's a, it's a st similar story to Libya. And the reduction in poverty was dramatic. And he toughens the terms, not surprisingly, for foreign investment in petroleum. He was helped by high world oil prices. And his successor Maduro was crippled by the 2014 collapse in world oil price. Now since Chavez, including Chavez in 20 years, Washington has sought regime change uh, and alleges democracy deficits. Chavez survived one attempted coup in 2002. He'd only been in office a couple of years. Uh, and Maduro attempted assassination last year by drone. Washington has imposed severe sanctions on Venezuela's oil and banking sectors, making it very difficult for American companies to import <coughs> Venezuelan oil into American refineries. And sanctions on top Venezuelan officials too. What about Canada? Well, uh, Canada's created this Lima group uh, and imposed sanctions as well. And the group comprises one third of the countries of Latin America plus Canada, not the United States, they're in the background. Uh, a bit like the, the Wizard of Oz, you know, Dr. Dr. Marvel there. And this group of one third of the American, Latin American countries is a cherry picked group uh, against Maduro with such wonderful countries as Honduras and Guatemala and Bolsonaro's uh, Brazil, I can continue, and the hard mineral countries down the, down the Andean. Now, China and Russia uh, support Maduro, and over the years they've invested big time in Venezuela's oil. The United Nations is divided, and the Venezuelan people are divided too. Now, Earlier this year, I was at a seminar, a uh, graduate seminar with my wife uh, at the University of Ottawa. That's a kind of a prelude of what we're all in for. And that's what it was like that day. And one of the students was from Colombia, uh, a neighbor to Venezuela, right? And she spoke passionately and understandably about the misdeeds of the Venezuelan government and the suffering of the people. We want the United States to intervene, is what she said. So Q&A, what was I going to say to that? Well, why, I said, uh, can you name one US intervention that's been a success story? Uh, Afghanistan, we heard it earlier, uh, Iraq, Libya, Syria, Ukraine, uh, I can't think of any, maybe you can, so you can tell me after. So what should Canada do? I said, perhaps nothing. Under the Charter of the United Nations and the Charter of the Organization of American States, no country, no country is entitled to interfere in the internal affairs of another. And uh, Canada has signed both charters. Uh, I'm not a lawyer, but I've read, the, I've read the charter to be careful before I said these words. And the sanctions on Venezuela are not, I repeat that, not, endorsed by the United Nations nor by the OAS. So how Canada justifies what it's doing, you have to ask uh, Ottawa. 
As a result of US and Canadian sanctions, however, uh, no however, Venezuelan oil exports have tanked, they've gone down. And our media blames it on Venezuelan mismanagement. You see that in the Globe and other papers all the time. I, I perceive economic warfare at the expense of people. But the good news is that uh, to, to Canada's good fortune, US refineries are switching from Venezuelan heavy oil. They can't import it uh, to oil sands bitumen. So Canada benefits the oil trains are running down to Texas. What are Iran and Venezuela doing about US and Canadian, particularly US, pressure? Well, they've turned to China and Russia for loans and support, as I said, and all the four countries between themselves are abandoning petrodollars. That's the, system, that's the use of US dollars in petroleum trade that's been incredibly beneficial to, to the United States economy. And they're using yuan and rubles and euros perhaps, uh, and, indeed, and, and gold uh, to trade in oil. The Chinese have made the yuan and, and gold interchangeable. And the use of non-US currencies is a serious challenge to the US dollar. In 2003, Iraq was planning to move away from petrodollars. And in 2011, uh, Libya was planning the same under Gaddafi. And look what happened to them. So to this day, Iraq and Libya continue to trade in US dollars. Well, if you are surviving that lot, that was oil. I have less to say about gas, but I do want to say something about the natural gas because the geopolitics are enormous there too, and they're much less reported, certainly in Canada. Gas, as you know, moves around the world by pipeline, particularly about 90%, but also by tanker, by LNG tanker, and uh, LNG being liquefied natural gas. And LNG projects are complex things. There's a talk about the, the LNG chain, uh, multi-billion dollar investments. Uh, at the loading port, the natural gas is refrigerated into liquid and it shrinks it into one six hundredth of its space. It takes much less space in a tanker. And at the delivery terminal, you have to regasify it. Now, Canada is the world's third largest producer of gas, and companies are fracking for gas in northeast British Columbia, and they plan to export it to Asia. Countries like China uh, are abandoning coal, and they're switching to natural gas big time to reduce horrendous air pollution. And there's a new plan to e export Albertan gas uh, to Europe. And Europe is the world's second largest gas market after North America. And the idea is to ship the gas by existing pipelines all the way to Nova Scotia, and then it's by LNG tanker to Europe. That's, that's where Canada's coming from. Uh, about the United States now. Uh, the United States with fracking has become the world's largest producer of gas, overtaking Russia, and it has a problem of markets. Well, some of it, of course, comes up into southwest Ontario, maybe Hamilton. And the United States has become a major exporter of LNG, rivaling the two biggies, which are Australia and Qatar. And it's come out from almost nowhere. Now, the United States wants to muscle in on Europe's huge gas market, displacing Russian gas. So you can see how the geopolitics is developing. And Washington calls it freedom gas. I think in the night 2003, they accused them, they, did, they dropped talking about French fries, and they moved over to, to, to freedom fries in, the, in, the, in Congress. Uh, and President Trump tweeted this year, with shipping freedom and opportunity abroad. US LNG, I guess Canadian too, will face stiff competition uh, from Russia, because Russia has also uh, entered the LNG game, and it already has two LNG plants and plants two more with foreign partners like Total, Shell, Exxon, Mobil. And from the Russian Arctic, ice-breaking tankers now move summer and winter to Europe, 
and uh, from the Russian Far East, let's think of Vladivostok, uh, LNG plankers, tankers ply to Asia. Russia is the world's largest gas exporter, mostly by pipeline, and Europe is a vital energy market for Russia. And the European Union imports 70% of its gas, and Russia is the biggest source, then Norway, which is not part of the European Union, and Algeria. Europe has been using Russian gas since the 1960s, it was then called Soviet gas. And the binding of East and West at that time by pipeline helped build trust. You remember the Iron Curtain, it helped make it rusty. And pipelines joined countries physically, diplomatically, and economically. Maybe they join uh, provinces as well. Washington has always opposed Russian oil and gas to Europe. Uh, it cites energy security. In the Soviet era, gas pipelines to Europe were built mostly via the Ukraine. And when the Soviet Union broke up, Ukraine became independent. In recent years, Ukraine's payment problems, corruption and hostility to Russia have threatened Russia's gas exports and oil, but particularly gas, its foreign exchange earnings. So Russia depends upon oil and gas for about 60% of its foreign exchange earnings and about 40% of, of, uh, of its uh, uh, central government uh, revenues. Now, after the independence of uh, Ukraine, um, the US invested, 1991, uh, the US invested big time in building democratic skills in inst institutions uh, in uh, Ukraine, whatever that means. Uh, and according to uh, Victoria Newland, an interesting lady, as I'll tell you about her, uh, Washington's top diplomat for the region at that time, uh, the U.S. spent five billion dollars. That's B with a billion with a B, uh, or most mostly on uh, helping build, uh, help, helping uh, Ukraine in, in its aspirations towards democracy. And Washington openly supported the uh, Maidan protests in Kiev. You recall them. There was Senator McCain was there, uh, and so was Victoria Newland, uh, Assistant Secretary of State for, the, for, for Eastern Europe, the Near East. And she was caught on open line uh, phoning the US ambassador, Jeffrey Pyatt. So be very careful with your cell phones. Uh, they were discussing which opposition leaders to support, uh, and she was talking about how to midwife the thing. I, I've heard this telephone call, you, you can Google it, you can actually listen to it. Uh, so I call that Victoria's Secret Revealed. <laughs> In 2014, the democratically elected government was ousted. Uh, the president fled, you know all that. And the government, but the government, incoming government, within 24 hours, pa passed a law opposing the use of Russian as an official language. And you can see that in a Canadian context, where it would be uh, overjoyed in Quebec. And that almost immediately led to uprisings in the Crimea and eastern uh, Ukraine, which is the Russian-speaking area. And our media uh, rarely mention the language divisions within Ukraine. So I thought I'd just introduce this little map. Uh, Ukraine's a, a big country, uh, and East and West are culturally different. If anybody's from the Ukraine here, they can straighten me out after this talk. But uh, Ukrainian speakers are shown there in red and pink, uh, and they tend to look West. And the Russian speakers shown there in yellow, cream, and brown uh, tend towards Russia. And the, the distances are really quite revealing. Uh, from west to east within Ukraine, there's a big distance, and it's, it's, uh, it's further than for, from, a, from a western Ukrainian point of view going, to up to, going up into Germany, or from an eastern Ukrainian point of view going up to Moscow. <coughs> now, uh, skipping over that, and uh, to say that all countries want 